want to give you a message today that the Lord gave, gave me some time ago. And the Lord knows when people need certain messages. And I don't know who may need this today. If you're watching by internet, by mygladtinies.org, or if you are streaming this message today, I want to give you this message today. It is a dear message that I hope that it will encourage each and every one of you today. Even if you're in the house or if you're watching, I want you to be encouraged by this message. Help for discouragement in our life and times. Help for discouragement in our life and times. We're going to be in Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. And listen to these verses as I preach this message for help for discouragement in, li in our life and times. And I want you to take this home with you. This may be not for some of you, but it's for all of us to keep in our, keep in our minds. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who, for, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Father, we thank you, love you, and praise you, and give you honor and praise and glory for your blessings. Thank you for this Memorial Day that you blessed us to be here with, Lord, and we honor you and glorify you because of what you've done for us. We praise you, Jesus, that those who have left us are with you in glory, and we thank you for this day that you've given us Father, I don't preach in my own strength, but I preach in yours. And on this day, someone may be discouraged, Lord, but Father, I know you can touch and bless each one. Whether they're listening on streaming or whether they're on mygladtidings.org, I pray that you will encourage each hearer in your precious name. And we thank you, Father, and give you praise, honor, and glory. Again, Lord, I don't preach in my own strength, but I preach in yours. We give you thanks and praise. Amen. Let me read those verses again for you. Let me go back over them sometime during the message. But it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, lay us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured much, such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls." Discouragement is something that we all live with from time to time. And it's easy for us to allow the pressures and burdens of life to overwhelm us and cause us to be in despair sometimes. You know, discouragement is a killer. It's one of the biggest weapons of our enemy's arsenal. And discouragement has caused many people to drop out of church. It's caused them to quit on God. 
It's caused people to take their own lives because they are discouraged about life. It has caused many preachers to give up the fight and lay down their Bibles. Listen to what John Calvin said about his life. Great preacher. He says, in addition to the in immense troubles by which I so sorely consume, there's almost no day on which some new pain or, or anxiety does not come. Charles Spurgeon had this to say about his own battles with discouragement. He said, discouragement creeps over my heart and makes me go with heaviness to my work. It is dreadfully weakening. It is that way with many God's precious people. Servants and saints this morning, and, and, and some of you who may be watching or watching today and listening to this sermon today, or hopefully none in this very room are discouraged in your walk with the Lord. You're thinking about throwing in a towel. You're considering dropping out on the Lord. But you know what? Before you do, I, I, I would like to remind you that God did not save you so that you could live your life in a state of discouragement. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the power and love and, a sound, and, a, and of a sound mind. That verse would seem to indicate that you and I do not have to live with discouragement as our constant companion. Because there are some people who are living with that life in a state of discouragement today. Timothy, to whom this verse was addressed to, was going through some, some, some great opposition to the message and himself as a leader, opposition to his youth because he was young, and his association with Paul. And he's encouraging Timothy to not be discouraged and to use what the Holy Spirit has given him and Finish the Lord's work. He was called to do this. He has been given, he's given us the power and love and a sound mind, which is wisdom. And I think the Bible teaches us that, that it is possible to win the battle over discouragement. God has a plan to deliver, deliver you from the draining and weakening effects of discouragement. In fact, I think of the verses, these verses here that I've just read to you this morning. It tells much, tells much about accomplishing that. And there's some steps that these verses that we can follow that will protect us against the infection of discouragement as you run this Christian race. Let's take a few moments this morning. One more time to see about these verses and how it helps us in discouragement. Help for discouragement in our life and times. Verse 1 reads again, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. First, we must commit to a life of faithful running. First of all, this requires preparation. I want you to get this. No one wakes up in the morning and decides to run a 26-mile marathon. That kind of race requires much preparation. So does the spiritual race. If we are to run well, then we must prepare properly. We must have freedom from the weights that hinder us or burdens us down. Anything that would hinder us from running well must be laid aside. You know, runners, they will strip away all that is not necessary so they might run faster and farther. They get lean and light so that they can win their race. And you know, I'm watching a 26-mile marathon, or if you've seen long-distance races for both men and women, whether in Olympics or whether in a track meet, you see that they have nothing hindering them 
as of physical weight. They're small and thin and in great shape. And what a lesson for the Christian runner. Anything that has more of you than Jesus does has to go if you are to run well. Who knows that this morning? Whatever your tension, whatever your time, your resources, your, your, your strength, etc., it is a weight in your life. It has to be laid aside if you're going to run well. If it is dealt with, if it is not dealt with, you will become discouraged. And then we have to have freedom from the sins that entangles us. The picture here is an athlete stripping himself, stripping himself down so that he can run well. And in fact, in the ancient Greek games, they ran naked. They ran in the nude. Now, that's not the case in modern times. But they wear outfits that is of the loosest and the smallest fabric, if you see them. But can you imagine a world-class distance athlete running in a race in an overcoat? Of course not. They, they shed everything they can so they can run without entanglements. Again, this speaks of the Christian runner as well. Did you know that you can still sin after you get saved? Oh, y'all got quiet on me. Y'all got quiet on me. How many of you can still sin after you get saved? Yeah, that's right. You still, you, you still can sin. You will still desire evil. In fact, one of the biggest shocks of the Christian life is how easily you can sin after you've been saved. You know that thought will still grow into lust. That word may still slip out every now and then. That old anger may flare up out of, the, out of control every now and then. Your attitude might get rotten from time to time. Oh, come on now. Being saved doesn't prevent you from sinning, but your sinning does prevent you from running your waist well. We are told that there are besetting sins, those things that are of a particular problem for us as individuals. They must be dealt with. And we are to remove ourselves from their presence and get away from their places where they can take us, places where they can, they can come in our hearts and souls. We must stay away from those places. Guard yourself against their attack. We have to get radical and honest about the sins that afflict us as believers. There's this story I want to tell you of this mechanic friend that a pastor uses. He got saved, came to church and got saved. Now, let me let you know, he had a foul mouth. He had a foul mouth before he met Jesus. And after he was saved, he was still having a problem with his language. He talked to his pastor about the problem, and the pastor came up with a plan. He said, every time you feel like using profanity, just sing a hymn instead. A few days later, the preacher stopped by because the man was working on his car in his shop to see how he was going, how he's doing. He asked the brother, he said, hey, how's it going? He said, oh, pretty good, said the man. But he said, but I've sung every hymn I know today and made up three or four more. See, that illustrates the problem we have with sin, but God will help you conquer it if you are sincere and will trust him in the matter. He will give you victory over the things that hinder your race. Don't let the hindrances and the loads of life and the entanglements of sin cause you to become discouraged in your race for Jesus. And of course, this requires Patience, it says. We are told to run with endurance, which is patience, and the race that is set before us. We are said to be in a race. 
This word means a struggle or a contest. Our English word agony comes from the Greek word. And that sure does describe the road of life, doesn't it? It, it? it describes it. Sometimes life is good. The road is smooth and the way is easy. But there are other times when it feels like you're running blindfolded. You're running uphill through a minefield. Has anyone ever felt that way before in your lifetime? Yeah. It seems there are times when life is a struggle, it's an agony, and it's a living misery sometimes. Those are the times that call for endurance and patience. And of course, God never said that it would be easy. And in truth, he said just the opposite. John 6, 16 and 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world we will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Job 14 and 1 tells us, Man who is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Now the word patience, let me talk about this word patience for a moment. It means endurance. It means settling in for the long haul. It carries the ideal of, 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 of commitment in the race in spite of the obstacles or the difficulties. We're not running a short dash, folks. We are running a marathon. And don't be like a Roman candle, Roman candles like we used to do and some of you still do on the 4th of July. Don't be like a Roman candle, a little pop, a little flash, a little burst of excitement and then nothing. Just be steady. If you're a prayer warrior, a witness, a church member, just be steady. Run your race and settle in for the long haul. Make up your mind to be committed to the race. Make up your mind to be committed to this race, folks. Make up your mind that nothing will prevent you from running a good, patient race for the glory of God. Let me read verses 2 and 3 again. Praise God. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. As we run this race, we are to keep ourselves focused. We are to concentrate on things that will prevent us from becoming discouraged as we run this race. And the writer tells us what those things are. First of all, we are to be focused on the per person of Jesus. Paul says, looking unto Jesus. That's how the Christian life began. It began with the look. Looking God us into the race and keeping our eyes on him that who helps us to do well as we run this race. And notice in the phrase in verse 1, it says, the race that is set before us. This seems to me to indicate that we each run our own race. I can't run your race. You can't run in my race. Now, if I spend my time looking at you and how well you're doing, I'm liable to become discouraged in my own race. I might become defeated because I am not doing as well as you are. Then I might try to run in your lane. Or I might stumble over pride if I begin to speak, if I begin to think that I'm doing better than you. Or I might even get discouraged if I think that the way you're running has affected my own race. And I allow my failures and my stumbles to hinder me. In other words, keep this. If I keep my eyes on you and how you're running, I am in trouble. The only way for any of us can run well is for us to keep our eyes focused on the Savior. 
to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. He's the only one we have to run for. He's the only one that we need to please. Listen, he's the race judge. He's the author and the finisher of the race of life. He gives out the rewards. He disqualifies the runners. He calls the race and he is the one. The only one to watch as the race progresses. Get your eyes off of the other racers and how they're doing. And we need to get our eyes on Jesus alone and run a better race. And we also, we need to stay focused on the performance of Jesus. Listen, not only, thank you, Lord. Not only should we keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus as we run, but also on his performance. Why? Because he finished our race for us. As we run this race of life, let us take courage in the fact that Jesus Christ has already passed this way. He ran the race ahead of us and he has completed his race. In so doing, he also completed ours as well. Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. That means that we run and face the pressures of life that when we do that, we have him to help us along the way. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He knew his share of trials in the race of life, but he successfully navigated his course. Look what he endured. He was born to an unwed mother. He was born in a stable. He was born to poor parents. His life was threatened as a baby. His birth was the cause of terrible sufferings. He was moved as a baby. He was raised in a despicable town. His father died when he was young. He had to support his family. He had no home and no place to lay his head. He was hated and opposed by others. He was charged with insanity. He was charged with demon possession. He was opposed by his family. He was rejected, hated, and opposed by the viewers and listeners who came to hear him speak. He was betrayed by a close friend. He was left alone, rejected, and forsaken by all his friends. He was tried before the high court of the land and tried with treason. He was executed as a common criminal by the means of crucifixion. Yes, friends, he's been through it all. He has been through it all, and he, and he is the perfect coach for those running the race today. So instead of looking everywhere else for help you need, we need to find our help in Jesus and in him alone. And then let me tell you something else here. Thank you, Lord. He then, he fixed our race for us. I will let you in on on a secret this morning. I want to let you in on something. (laughs) Jesus has not only run our race, but he has fixed it so we cannot lose. He has already won the victory and he shares that with us. 1 Corinthians 15 and 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's already fixed the end of the race. He has assured all of his saints, all of his children, and all the redeemed people of God 
that they will arrive safely at home. Folks, this thing is fixed and is set. I'm already a winner of the race of life. I'm already, I already have the victory. You know, all he asked me to do is to keep my eyes on him and run my race with patience. Yeah. Not in competition with any of you folks. This is my race. I have already won. All that remains is just to finish my course. However, I want to do well so that I can say what Paul said at the end of his own race. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. And then commit to a life of fulfilled running. Commit to this. Another lesson I want to give you that we can draw from this passage is the truth that this life does not have to be a discouraging mission or undertaking. But that can be a fulfilling adventure. I want to share a few, a few brief truths here. First of all, we have the fulfillment of remembering. When discouragement begins to mold its way into your life and mine, let's remember what Jesus did for us. To think that he would do that for you and me is evidence of his love for us and his work in our lives. May I remind you of something? That when the Lord in his, is in your corner, he's in your corner, folks. You have nothing at all to fear. And I can think of Romans 8 and 31. It says, what shall we then say to these things? Hallelujah. If God be for us, who can be against us? Remember to consider him when the dark days come. And I can, hallelujah, I can think of the song that says, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for saving me. Thank you, Jesus. And then there's the fulfilling of reward. You know, as I've already said, Jesus has run his race and paved the way for you and me. He has already assumed this place at the Father's right hand. And he sat down there signifying that his work of salvation was finished forever. But I want to remind you of something. That when the clouds of discouragement, when they begin to gather on the horizon of your life, that what Jesus enjoys this morning is also yours and mine. His heaven is our heaven. His place of reward is our place of reward. And his holy and comforting presence will be ours also. He promised us that, that, that he would take, uh, hallelujah, that he will make a place for us. Mm. He'll make a place for us there that he will return to take us home someday. Who believes that this morning? Because John 14, 1 through 3, he tells us that he's going to repair a place for us. And I'm wholeheartedly believing that promise for a new home someday. How about you today? You know what? That's enough sunshine for the cloudiest of days. Therefore, instead of being discouraged as you run your race, always remember it is not in vain. There's a fulfillment in knowing that God is keeping records one day. He will reward those who have run the race faithfully. Paul said, and this has been one of my, this has been, one, this has been with me since my mother passed, went to heaven. I can't stop thinking about it. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. 
Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And then there is fulfillment, the familiar of resting. Even as we run the race, there are times when our steps will grow heavy and our pace will slow down. We get a little tired and drain here. We will. However, let us remember that we are not home yet. There is a rest for the people of the Lord. There will come a day when we can unharness the burdens from our shoulders and sit at his feet of our sovereign Lord in heaven's glory. There will come a day when he will wipe away the tears of sorrow and exhaustion from our eyes. Let us remember that this life is not the place of rest for the servants of the Lord. It is a place of labor and faithful service. Therefore, do not grow weary. Galatians 6 and 9 tells us, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. One day, Thank you, Lord. One day, we will join Jesus in that new Jerusalem and his ultimate glory. And there we will rest in his presence from the burdens of this life. And you know what? By the way, thank you, Lord. It's possible to rest in his life even as we run this race. How do we do that? By keeping focus on Jesus and by learning to abide in him. And as we sung the song, as we learn to lean on him. John 15 and 5 says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing who knows here that we can lean on Jesus today he as I end he will let you run a race that will leave you fulfilled and rested Praise God. And as I end today, in front of the sound of my voice, don't let discouragement get you down today. If you are battling it today, bring it to Jesus this morning. Whether you're watching or listening today or whether you're in the house. One thing the Bible tells us, this battle is not ours. Our battle, the battle is the Lord's. It's time to let him refocus your priorities, lighten your load, and equip you to patiently run this race that he has set before us for his glory. Now, I want you to be honest with me, be honest with the Lord. Because he sees your heart, whether you're in the house or he knows when you're discouraged. He knows when you're going through. He knows when you're suffering. He knows it. He knows everything about us. So I want you to be honest with the Lord today. And tell him about everything that's going on in your life. 
You don't have that much that the Lord cannot consume. All he wants you to go to him as your resource today. If he can hear the voice of Moses, if he can hear the voice of Elijah, I can think of Hannah. If he can hear the voice of Hannah, and in, he comfort them, he can comfort you. He can do the same for you. And if you're in the sanctuary, there's help in him. I don't want you to leave without it today. And if you're watching and listening today, you, know, you may not know Jesus. You may not know the Savior. You may not have a firm relationship with him today. I want you to know that Jesus is willing to come into your heart and make things new. One thing I know, he can take the discouragement away. And he, he knows you've been feeling it. And he can substitute it with joy unspeakable. Jesus can make the difference in your life today. You've been trying to find ways, other ways, other means, and I mean some negative means that may not work. Drugs doesn't work. Alcohol doesn't work. The other things in this world doesn't work. The only problem solver we have is Jesus today. Find out that he can give you real peace and comfort in your life. He's willing and able to come into your heart and embrace your life with his precious salvation. He's able to do that. So why don't you meet him now? Because you don't want to meet him later. And if you made up your decision to give your heart to Jesus, we're going to pray this simple prayer. We're going to pray this together. If you're in the house today, you know that you're saved, you know that you know Jesus, you have a relationship, a firm relationship with, with Jesus, raise your hands today. If you have a firm relationship... I'm talking about a firm relationship. Raise your hands today. Praise God. I want you to know something today. And if you're watching and listening today, we cannot live this life without Jesus and his decisions that we make in his life should be a decision that he helps us make. I just feel this. Someone may be watching today who may be ready to take their life right now. You may be ready to take something to take you out of this world. No gun can help that. No drug or pills can help that. I ask you today that you will give Jesus a chance. And let him make your life peaceful and give you hope for the future. And if you're watching today or you're in the house, if you need Jesus, let's pray. Everyone in this house, bow your heads and say this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time in my life that you've given me. I know, Lord, my heart is before you. You see my heart. And I ask you, Father, I ask you, Father, to save my soul. I need you in my life. I need you in my heart. I need you in my mind and my soul. I can't do this by myself. I need your help. Please help me, Lord. Come into my life. Save my soul. Give me a new hope. 
I want to see you in heaven, Lord. And I can't do this without you in my life. I need you, Father. Please forgive me of my sins and my shame. Give me a new lease on life. Help me to do the right things. Give me peace and take away the discouragement I feel. I know, Lord, that you're able. And I know, Lord, with you in my life, I will have peace, I will have comfort, and I'll have your love. And I thank you. I believe you died on the cross and you rose on the third day for victory. And I thank you. Now, Lord, I believe you've forgiven me of my sins. I know now that I'm your child and I will live for you forever. Without a shadow of a doubt, I know, I know that I'm saved and I believe I'm saved. Help me to find a Bible-believing church and read your word. I give you thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand praise today, folks. Hallelujah.